Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on uh, the art of equity investing um, perspectives from buy side and this webinar is going to be taken by Dr. Harish Kumar. He is passionate about investments in markets. He has already managed um, multi-billion dollar mutual funds and um, hedge funds along with uh, the long and short equity strategies. He's also worked in the area of equity research, including building quantitative stock selection models, portfolio construction techniques, and risk modeling. He's done CFA, and uh, he's also a doctor. That's he has achieved his PhD. Now you can attend his webinar. In case you have any doubts, you can type the questions in the questions panel, or simply mail your questions to yashu at the rate enev.com. That's Y A S H U at the rate. E N E E V dot com. So Harish, you can take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Yeshu. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, the topic of today's webinar is perspectives from the buy side, the art of equity investing. For those who are not familiar with the terms buy side and sell side, this slide shows you their respective functions. Buy-side professionals manage money for institutional clients. Buy-side professionals also manage mutual funds for individual investors. They include fund managers and buy-side analysts who make decisions on what assets to buy and sell. The buy-side professionals are typically paid for generating superior returns relative to their benchmark and also for increasing assets under management. Examples of big buy-side companies are Fidelity, Vanguard, and PIMCO. The sell-side professionals typically work in brokerage houses such as Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, CSFP, Sanford Bernstein, etc. Their main function is to provide service to the buy-side professionals by executing their orders for trades, and providing them research and advice on managing the fund. They are typically paid for increasing business relationship with their buy-side counterparts and thus generating more commissions. In this presentation, we'll focus on how large institutional buy-side professionals manage equity funds. Next slide. We're going to talk about how fund managers manage an equity fund or portfolio. We will focus on institutional fund managers who manage billions of dollars for their institutional clients or in mutual funds. We will focus on institutional fund managers who manage billions of dollars for their institutional clients or in mutual funds. Institutional clients can be pension plans of large companies, university endowments, banks, insurance companies, investment advisors, and so on. This talk will not touch upon specialized strategies such as statistical arbitrage, pairs trading, or even high turnover hedge funds. There are broadly three steps in managing an institutional style equity portfolio. First is stock selection. what stocks to buy and how many stocks to buy in a fund or portfolio are the main decisions that fund managers need to make. We will talk about stock selection in more detail in the coming slides. The second step is portfolio construction. In this step, the fund manager decides how to allocate money among the stocks that he has selected. He needs to identify the sources of risk in his portfolio and construct the portfolio in such a way that the return of the portfolio is maximized with respect to the risk, of risk in the portfolio. He also needs to adhere to client guidelines while constructing the portfolio for his clients. Again, we will discuss this in more detail in the coming slides. The third step in managing the portfolio is to continuously monitor the portfolio and make changes to the portfolio so that the reward to risk ratio is optimal. The strategy for making changes or rebalancing the portfolio includes the rules that determine changes to the portfolio, what stocks in the portfolio to buy and sell, and the frequency of making changes. 
We will address this last in the presentation. Let's go to the next slide. In this presentation, we will look at how a fund is managed by a buy-side institutional company. We will talk about and contrast money management styles from the lens of quantitative style of investing and fundamental style of investing. I am doing this because from a career perspective, you have to choose one style or the other depending on your aptitude and interest. As the style you choose will take you down different career paths on the buy side. What is quantitative investing? Quantitative investing is a rules based or algorithmic way of investing using computer models. The quantitative investor studies large amounts of financial data using statistical and econometric methods in order to make computer models that rate stocks for their risk and return. Quantitative investors study decades of historic data including financial statements, items, pricing, short interest, insider trading data, etc. for thousands of stocks for identifying signals of factors which predict stock returns. They combine these signals in an optimal way to construct a computer model which is called a multi-factor model. They invest across a diversified basket of stocks to get exposure to the signals given by the model. Price trends and valuation are examples of some signals. The quantitative investors rely heavily on risk management to construct their portfolio. They construct the portfolio often using an optimizer and a risk model to target desired risk reward characteristics in the portfolio, taking into account the covariance structure of the signals or factors. Quantitative investors rebalance their portfolio in a disciplined way to maximize the reward to risk ratio, taking into account the transaction costs involved in trading stocks. Everything that the quantitative investor does is based on studying and backtesting years of historical data and simulating their trading strategies in as many market environments in the past as possible. Because of their heavy reliance on computers and automation, quantitative strategies are more scalable in the sense that a small team of two people can run a billion dollars in two or more portfolio strategies. What is fundamental investing? Fundamental investing is a more traditional investing style where a fund is managed by a portfolio manager and a team of buy-side analysts who rely on their experience, judgment and intuition. Here the companies are analyzed in great detail to understand the impact of macroeconomic trends on the company, the nature of the industry in which it operates its financial and operational characteristics and catalysts that can move its stock. The fundamental fund manager spends a lot of time meeting with company management, interacting with sell-side analysts and meeting with industry experts to understand the companies deeply. This approach enables the fund management team to focus on far fewer stocks than a quantitative manager due to the time involved in analyzing each company. The expertise that the manager acquires in a few stocks and industries allows him to make profits from investing in a select number of stocks with greater conviction. Due to the labor intensive nature of their strategy, this type of investing is not as scalable as quantitative investing. Let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, before that, I just want to summarize the previous slide. Summarizing, uh, quantitative managers depend on exposure to quantitative signals on a large number of stocks to make money, while fundamental investors depend on exposure to a few stocks to make money. Let's now talk about the stock selection approaches taken by the quantitative investors and the fundamental investors in more detail in the next couple of slides. This slide shows you how a quantitative manager does stock selection. The main objective for a quantitative portfolio manager is to identify and construct signals or factors that can predict stock returns. 
the factors are combined to form a multi-factor computer model in proportion to their risk to reward ratio. Some models have weights in the factors that change dynamically over time and other models have relatively static weights. The manager gains exposure to the quantitative model or factors by using a diversified basket of stocks. Typically, the manager holds from 200 to 500 or more stocks in his portfolio. The quantitative manager has often very little knowledge of individual companies and therefore will not take large positions in any one stock. How does a quantitative manager or analyst identify the signals or factors? As we discussed before, quantitative managers study financial database extensively. Quantitative managers typically combine analysis of large amounts of data and a theoretical knowledge of investment finance to think of new ideas for their stock selection models. Some of the important financial databases are CompuStat and Worldscope for company level financial statement. IBES for analyst estimates of stocks, earnings and revenue estimates. IDC for pricing and dividend data. These databases are available through market vendors such as Bloomberg or FactSet. Some examples of the predictive signals that have been studied extensively are earnings yield, which is basically the inverse of the PE ratio, earnings growth, such as growth of stocks earnings year over year, or five year rate of growth in earnings in stocks, or the forecasted long term growth, earn, growth rates in earnings of a stock. Another predictive signal is free cash flow yield. Free cash flow is basically the cash flow the company generates that can, that can be used for discretionary purposes after spending on what is needed to keep the business running. Yet another predictive signal could be share repurchase, which calculates the rate of purchase of a company's own share by itself at a good price. And uh, some other factors are dividend yield and dividend growth. These signals or factors are backtested rigorously in different market environments for their power in predicting stocks. These signals or factors are typically combined in proportion to their strength in forecasting stock returns to create the stock selection model. This model is run on a set of stocks, could be thousands, to rank in order of their future expected returns. You can get a sense of the kind of work quantitative investors do for identifying new signals or factors by looking at some of the academic research papers such as Richard Sloan's paper on accruals or Jagadish and Tickman's paper on price momentum. Now let's talk about how fundamental investors go about selecting stocks, which is very different from how quantitative investors do stock selection. And that's in the next slide. So this slide talks about stock selection in fundamental strategies. Fundamental managers typically manage portfolios of 20 to 60 stocks depending on the desired level of risk in the portfolios. So their portfolios are much more concentrated than a quantitative fund. So what are the steps that a fundamental manager uses to identify attractive stocks? A typical fundamental manager looks at the top-down picture of the economy followed by a bottom-up analysis. What is top-down? It means looking at the big picture, the macroeconomy, to figure out the big emerging trends in the world. Let me give you some examples. The growth of the middle class in emerging markets such as China and India increases the markets for aspirational goods. This is good for stocks like Nike and Apple, which are benefiting from these trends. Another example is the response to obesity rates and the increase in diabetes and the response is through healthy lifestyle, healthy living. Some companies that are benefiting from these trends are Whole Foods Markets and Nestle. Yet another example is the response to environmental changes and global warm warming through use of alternative energy sources. First, solar energy and Cree semiconductor are trying to take advantage of growth in alternative sources of energy. Managers spend time studying these trends and identifying companies that can benefit from these trends. Once that's done, the manager does a detailed bottom-up analysis of companies. 
The first step in the detailed bottom-up analysis of a company is talking to the company management, which typically means the CEO and the executive team of the company. Company management can make or break a business. Therefore, fund managers put a lot of emphasis on analyzing management caliber through analyzing their track record and integrity. They also like management to set expectations on the progress of the business realistically so that they deliver on these expectations. A lot of time is spent in attending earnings conference calls and industry conferences. So example of a company with a great management is Danaher, which has grown through making strategic acquisitions that have that resulted in consistent earnings growth. Another area of analysis has to do with the evolution of the industry, industry dynamics, and the competitive position of the company in the industry. Often, the fund manager and his team of advisor analysts talk to the sell side analysts or to the industry experts to get a deep understanding of the industry. This step is important because even a greatly run company, company's fate is determined by the industry in which it operates. Just to give you an example, in the semiconductor industry, the industry is highly cyclical and volatile with constant innovation and increasing pricing pressure due to intense competition. These competitive dynamics in the semiconductor industry has constrained even a highly innovative and greatly run company like Intel. Following this step, the fund manager does a comprehensive analysis of a company's financial and operational strength, how it manages its working capital for day-to-day -day operations, its debt load, whether the cash flow is sustainable, etc. Often a company that has innovative products that are in high demand can fail due to poor working capital management. For example, the accounts receivables or the inventory is poorly managed. After this, the fund manager is looking for companies that have a short to medium term catalyst. Some examples of catalysts is divesting a non-core business that unlocks value in the company. Another example of a catalyst is buying back its own shares. Yet another catalyst is a strategic acquisition that the company does that moves the needle in terms of earnings. Examples of a company that could benefit from divesting non-core assets is Apache Energy, which recently sold its stake in Egypt and is concentrating in the US and thus unlocking value. A company like Direct TV is a very consistent in buying back its own shares at a good price and thus creating shareholder value. The management, the fund managers ideally would like to invest in a company whose business fundamentals are improving such as an innovative product cycle. A good example is Apple's iPhone or where there is a consolidation within the industry that leads to better prospects for the company. A good, a good example in the, is a recent consolidation of the airline industry in the US, com benefiting companies like Delta Airlines. Following this in-depth fundamental analysis, the fund manager creates a detailed spreadsheet model of the company's financials to forecast future earnings and cash flow over the next three to five years. This can be used to arrive at an expected return for the company based on discounted cash flow analysis or looking at a company's earnings multiples with respect to itself and industry peers historically. So in the previous two slides, we saw how quantitative and fundamental investors select stocks for the portfolio. In the next step, we'll talk about how portfolios are constructed using the stocks that were selected. Let's go to the next slide. So we have seen how quantitative managers and fundamental managers select stocks for the portfolio. The next step is to construct the portfolio. Here risk management considerations are primary. Quantitative managers pay more attention to risk management and use more sophisticated tools relative to their fundamental counterparts. Many quantitative investors typically use an optimizer or a risk model to construct the portfolio. Barra, Axioma, and Northfield are some vendors who provide custom-made risk models and optimizers. Quantitative managers with more resources build their own risk model and optimizers. 
The idea of portfolio construction is to maximize exposure to the sources of high returns through the model and at the same time eliminate or minimize other sources of risk. So the objective is to maximize expected returns, net of transaction costs and minimize risks in the portfolio. For example, the managers want to be diversified across economic drivers of stock returns such as interest rates, geopolitical risks, currency risks, sensitivity to GDP or oil prices. They also want to size their position in individual stocks and industries carefully so that they are immune to one stock or an industry blowing up. The portfolio's market capitalization exposure is monitored since large capitalization, large capitalization stocks and small capitalization stocks have different behavior. The portfolio's style exposure is also monitored. What is style? Broadly, stock can be classified into two styles, growth stocks and value stocks. Growth stocks and value stocks have different behavior. A stock like Facebook, which is a growth stock, behaves very differently from a stock like IBM, which is a value stock. So a portfolio style exposure is also monitored by the fund manager to prevent biases in the portfolio that can hurt the expected returns. Finally, the manager monitors the beta of the portfolio. Beta is the sensitivity of the portfolio returns to market returns. The idea is to perform well versus the benchmark or market after taking market-like risks. So the manager targets betas similar to the benchmark over time in his portfolio in order to prevent taking excess returns, excess risks against his benchmark. The fund manager also monitors risks in his portfolio. The fundamental manager also uh, monitors risks in his portfolio, but typically is much less constrained by risk considerations relative to the quantitative manager. He generally allocates money in order of his conviction in each stock. He takes much larger positions in the stock because he believes that his conviction and deep knowledge of the company can overcome the larger stock specific risk that he is taking in the portfolio. Once a manager has constructed the portfolio, he has to monitor the portfolio on a daily basis and trade and rebalance to maintain the optimal risk versus reward ratio in the portfolio of fund. We will talk about this in the next slide. So the quantitative manager monitors the exposure of his portfolios to various signals or factors and risk characteristics to see if they need to be changed. For example, if one of the signals he uses is a valuation measure, say price to sales, and his exposure to price to sales has decreased relative to other signals, he has to trade to increase his exposure to the signal. Quantitative managers generally trade baskets of stocks at a time, unlike fundamental managers who trade one stock at a time. Quantitative managers often tend to pay a lot of attention to transaction costs while trading because transaction costs or commission costs can be detracted to their returns if not monitored carefully. ITG is a company that has an excellent software that can be used to model transaction costs. The two parts to transaction costs are trade commissions and impact costs. Impact cost is due to the fact that the stock can move when a manager trades it. The manager also looks at the liquidity of a stock because depending on the amount of money he is managing, it can take days to buy a full position in a stock or sell out of the stock. This can impact his performance significantly. The fundamental manager monitors his stock holdings continuously to see if any changes are required. For a fundamental manager, the three major considerations in substituting one stock with another are 1. If his investment thesis has played out. 2. Are there more attractive opportunities than what he, what he currently owns in the portfolio? And 3. Does he need to adjust his stock rates in the portfolio to adjust risk? So we have seen an overview of how a fund manager works and some of the skills and tools that are used in the profession. In this final slide, I just wanted to talk about the fact that investing is a great career 
An investing career on the buy side, managing mutual funds or institutional money can be a highly rewarding and satisfying career in multiple ways. There are few other professions where one can see the results of his or her effort in a short period of time. Due to the dynamic nature of the market, it never becomes monotonous. So what are the skills and tools required in this career? Preparing for your CFA gives you a great background in finance and accounting and portfolio management theory. For quantitative investors, statistics, econometric modeling and database management skills are necessary to study and interpret vast amounts of financial data. Some of the most common tools that are used in investing are FactSet, Bloomberg, SAS, S Plus, MATLAB, and Morningstar. For fundamental investors, study of macroeconomic trends and industries, reading company filings such as annual reports, 10Ks, and quarterly reports, 10Qs, attending company earnings conference calls, and in a background of work experience in a particular industry are useful. For example, you find a lot of medical doctors often take up an investing career and become specialists in healthcare stocks. Hopefully, I have given you an overview of what happens on the buy side in managing a mutual fund or institutional investing. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Harish. I think um, there have been no questions raised so far. And I believe it was a pretty explanatory webinar. Like I, I don't even know what questions to ask. Um, so we'll just wait for any question to come in. Sure. Okay. How important are these um, tools, the Bloomberg and SAS tool, when it comes to investing? Like these are all analytics-oriented tools, right? So how important are these? So both Bloomberg and FactSet are used by almost all institutional investors. Both FactSet and Bloomberg contains all the various financial databases and they also have the tools for analyzing the data. And these uh, Bloomberg and FactSet also carry risk models and optimizers within them. So they by themselves are very powerful tools for, for uh, investing in stocks. Um. Okay. How about the tool called Metastock? Uh, Raj Mohan wants to ask, how about the tool called Metastock? I'm not familiar with Metastock. Which is also used in industries, he says. Okay. I'm not familiar with that tool. I'm sure there are several other tools um, that are there used for investing. I just mentioned the very basic and the most popular tools. Uh, these okay. are and group and no. Star. Right. Um, Mohammed wants to uh, ask, how much exposure do quant investors need to be familiar with math? Um, quantitative investors, they need a basic knowledge in statistics and econometrics. But it's also useful to have a good knowledge of a good grounding in finance theory, very basic finance theory, which you can get by preparing for your CFA. So what is needed is the ability to interpret vast amounts of data right. through your knowledge of finance theory. Uh, statistics and econometrics are definitely useful and also some programming skills are necessary for database management, for just dealing with large amounts of data, uh, some programming skills are useful. So SAS, for example, is very commonly used. SAS, S Plus, MATLAB, Visual Basic Programming, these are very commonly used on the buy side for creating computer models. Right. Um, okay. There's another one which says, uh, also, do quant investors be exposed to programming languages to perform their strategies? So, apart from MATLAB, I guess even uh, investors use C++ for that matter, right? More sophisticated uh, quantitative investors use C++. Um, but on the buy side, where you see a lot of MBAs joining the buy side, they typically most of them, they don't know C++ 
a more higher level programming language such as SAS or MATLAB or S plus is more commonly used. But it definitely doesn't hurt to know C plus plus. So if you know C plus plus and some finance that can be powerful in um, as an investing tool. Okay, as a part of the previous question, uh, uh, Raj, Raj Mohan's question, facets Bloomberg does it give us buy signals? Both in facets and Bloomberg, you can construct signals. Signals are also called factors okay. uh, that predict stock returns. So you can construct them uh, in Factset and Bloomberg and then you can backtest them. So they have tools where you can backtest these signals to see if they have worked in the past. And based on whether they have worked in the past, you can use them in your models uh, to forecast future stock returns. Okay. And uh, to in addition to Mohammed's question where he asked the exposure in the programming languages, he asks what about R, the R language? Um, I'm not very familiar with R, but again, uh, uh, languages such as R and C++ are a plus. If you know them, that's very good. It's definitely a plus uh, in terms of uh, career in investing. Because once you know a language like R and C++, then it's easy for you to pick up something like SAS and S+. Plus. So I would say yes, they're very useful tools if you know that. Okay, then Harshal has a question. It's a career question. He says, what type of profile you should take in initial stage of career? What type of companies would entertain beginners? In case you want to be an investor on the buy side. Yeah, yeah as, so as I mentioned, there are two career paths. You can do quantitative investing or you can do fundamental investing. Right. And um, so I've also discuss what skills are needed for each kind of investing. And as far as joining a new company is concerned, all the big companies, the Fidelities, the Vanguards, the uh, uh, Putnam's or, or Kotec Mahindra, they all hire uh, people who are starting out. So as long as you have a basic knowledge in finance and some database management skills, some computer programming and some knowledge of statistics and economics, you should be all set to start a career in investing. Okay. Um, Mohammed continues his question by saying, why can't quants people just work in Excel since it's more user friendly? <laughs> Yeah, Excel is used a lot in uh, investing, especially by fundamental investors for creating company level financial statements. But often Excel is not powerful to analyze huge amounts of data. There's a limitation to Excel in analyzing huge amounts of data. So some, some of the quantitative investors, they analyze 10 gigabytes, 15 gigabytes of data, which is not even clean data to arrive at their stock selection models. For that kind of data, Excel may not be sufficient. So a lot of uh, applications, Excel is very good. Knowledge of Excel is very good. Right, and nowadays I believe the newest trends that uh, are in analytics are um, the big data and Hadoop. So they are used to analyze yeah. big data, like huge volumes of data. Yeah. Big data is much on a much much bigger scale than we use in the buy side. That right. Is, um, yeah, that's something very new. Um. Okay. There was another question. It was um, in portfolio. When you make your portfolio, you diversify to reduce the risk. But uh, how exactly do you trade between the uh, returns and the risk in your portfolio in that case? So what the objective of portfolio, the portfolio is to maximize returns and minimize risk. So mathematically speaking, you want to maximize reward to risk ratio. So 
the uh, how you do that you can use an optimizer to do that an optimizer for a quantitative investor an optimizer is a commonly used tool where you can maximize the returns and minimize the risks uh, in the terms of you can write an objective function and then write constraints for those who are familiar with optimization uh, for those who are fundamental investors basically uh, typically companies or fund managers they look at very basic measures of risk like beta or how much what is the what is the size in your stocks or what is the exposure to your industry and sectors in your portfolio so you control those um, and then have as much as much weight in the stocks that you believe in as possible so that's how you control risk reward and risk um, right how much is the variance in risk uh, in the quantitative investment strategy and the fundamental investment strategy um, quantitative investment strategies variance of risk is probably much lower than fundamental investment strategies because quantitative investors they are much more sophisticated in looking at risk and so they are very careful in controlling the risk while for fundamental investor strategies they are less uh, sophisticated and they pay a lot more attention to the return side okay, so they often take large uh, positions in stocks and therefore taking they take a lot more risk and there's more variance of risk in the fundamental style of management right um so in order to receive the signals in above set of tools is it we have to decide the strategy for giving buy signals and backtest it and backtest it if it was working previously yes exactly so the way signals are constructed is uh, you basically hypothesize so you theorize that uh, something you believe let's say just plain pe ratio you believe that that's a good signal so what you do is you construct that signal using fact set or bloomberg and then you back test it you can go back into the 1950s 60s 70s 80s and see it has worked in various environments whether it has worked during recessions whether it has worked during times of growth in the economy whether it has worked in good and bad times so that's how you decide by back testing whether a signal is useful or not and um, what's useful also that is to go through some of the research papers that are available uh, and research that has been done by a lot of professors. So I mentioned a couple of them: Richard Sloan's accruals paper and uh, Jagdish and Titman's uh, price momentum paper. There are thousands of such research papers that will help you in identifying the signals and will tell you. How they're back tested and how powerful they are. Um, right. Also, I wanted to find uh, ask you how different is it when you work with a big firm as an investor, and when you work independently as an investor on the buy side. A big firm typically manages billions of dollars, and it has a lot of resources in to manage that money. So. Your role will probably be very specialized. So, for example, you could be a quantitative analyst, and you could be focused on um, developing signals for a particular segment of the market, maybe the, uh, the U U.S. large cap market or an emerging market like um, China or India. In a small firm, if you're an independent investor, you pretty much have to do everything by yourself. So uh, you basically have to be a jack of all trades. I mean, it depends on whether you're a quantitative investor or a fundamental investor. So um, we have much less resources, and you have to do everything, starting from stock selection to portfolio construction and monitoring by yourself. So there's a huge difference. And while comparing investors and traders, like which one of them are on the same lines? Investors, investing is a completely different uh, career path from trading. Uh, trading is much more fast-paced environment uh, where um, stocks can be traded daily, weekly, monthly. Your performance is 
how your performance ju judged on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. But investing is uh, more longer term. You are judged on your annual performance or three-year performance, and um, you are usually manage a lot of lot more money while you're investing than while you're trading. Right, and comparing buy side versus sell side, or will it be similar? Buy side and similar uh, sell side are very different again. Typically, buy side investors they they of, they of course manage their own money. The buy side has traditionally been more stable uh, career, but also it's uh, much smaller than the small sell side. It may be easier to get a sell side job in the beginning than a buy side job. Uh, in terms of lifestyle, buy side uh, investors enjoy a much better lifestyle because their working hours are limited by the market trading hours. A uh, sell side is pretty, uh, it's a 15 hour job. Um, so that's some of, those are some of the differences between buy side and sell side. They're very different. Right. Um, I think that brings us to the end of question answer round as well. Um, if, in case we can just wait around in case somebody else has a question, they can type it out. Okay. Um, if we are a fundamental investor, a fundamental stock selection, what tools would you use for uh, detailed analysis of management quality and uh, competitive position? For analysis of management quality, there are not any ready-made tools available. Typically, the fundamental manager meets with company management. They have meetings with the CEO, they speak to the CEO and the executives on the phone, they speak to the competitors uh, management team. So they arrive at a judgment of the management quality by uh, interacting with the management. Of course, you can also look at management's background, their previous work experience, the track record, how they have delivered in their career in the past to get an idea of how they have um, to, the, to get an idea of the caliber. Um, it's important to attend earnings conference calls where the management is questioned uh, after each quarterly earnings call. Uh, it's also important to read up on 10Ks and 10Qs that are available freely on Edgar. These are annual and quarterly reports on the company to get an idea of, of how the management is managing the company. What was the other question? Uh, for competitive position, because uh, finding out the competitors and where a company stands in the entire market might not be easy to get. Yeah. Right. Again, it's, there's no easy solution there. Bloomberg has a list of competitors for each industry, and uh, they also have uh, data on the supply chain of each company. Uh, but in, to to get a good understanding of the competitive position, you have to speak to the sell side analysts who are experts at, at or who specialize in very few companies and therefore have great knowledge. You can also talk to industry experts, that is, people within the industry, to get a deeper idea. So there are no ready-made tools available. These are tools that you develop in your career by interacting with professionals over time. Okay, um, there are some a few career-oriented questions that are coming in. Can you highlight some companies in India who are recruiting for buy-side roles? Um, again, my knowledge is limited in the Indian market, but I think all the big companies in the U.S. Have all, do also have a presence in India, uh, if I'm not mistaken, which includes Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and companies like that. But there are also other companies like ING, YCI, and uh, um, ICICI Bank. HSBC. HSBC, right. Yes. We all have um, buy side divisions, asset management divisions, which hire people. Kotak Mahindra is, of course, a premier company on the buy side. OK. How much do companies stress on formal degrees? like MBA and accounting, is CFA sufficient? Uh, a CFA will go a long way. A CFA and a CPA, they go a long way in convincing companies that you have the right background. But an MBA certainly doesn't help because an MBA gives you a more broader perspective. CFA is very focused on finance and accounting. 
MBA also deals with marketing and statistics and uh, gives you a much broader perspective. So ideally, um, MBA is going to be useful to get your career started. Plus, CFA charter you can get only after working in a company for three years, I believe. So as part of the CFA uh, experience, you have to be working in a company. So to get started, you probably, you probably want a basic degree. Uh, the MBA is definitely valuable and uh, you need to take some courses in statistics, uh, accounting, finance, and uh, have some basic knowledge of programming. Right. Is there any other alternative uh, uh, certification course that helps uh in the same, something similar to CFA? Um, there, is, there are probably other certifications, but I'm just, I'm just not familiar with them. Um, there are, I've heard of risk management certifications. Um, How useful is a CAI in that case? Because that's also a very a widely acclaimed certification. Chartered Accountancy, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, Chartered Accountancy is definitely a very uh, good designation to have in India um, to get a job on the buy side because, again, that gives you probably as deep, if not deeper, exposure to finance and accounting than uh, CFA does. And that's also definitely very acceptable, I believe. Uh, not only CA, CAIA, Alternative Investments Certification and uh, CAIA. Yeah, I'm not familiar with CAIA, what that is. Okay. Uh, Harish, the, a few professors you mentioned previously, can you please repeat the names? Sure. Yeah. Um, Richard Sloan, so R-I-C-H-A-I-D, Richard, uh, S-L-O-A-N, Sloan. I believe he, he teaches at Wharton, oh. University of Pennsylvania, Wharton Business School, right? In, in University of Pennsylvania, and he has written a paper on accruals. Accruals is nothing but working capital, and so uh, that was an interesting paper, which showed you a signal. Other uh, paper that I mentioned was uh, Narasimhan and uh, Narasimhan Jagadish. So Jagadish is spelled J-E-G-A-D-E-S-H. And we wrote a paper with uh, Titman, T-I-T-M-A-N, on price momentum. The fact that just looking at price trends is helpful in um, forecasting stock returns. Uh, but the, the uh, original papers on quantitative investing, one of the beginners were Pharma and French, Eugene Pharma and French of University of Chicago. They wrote the original papers on quantitative investing. Uh, but that's probably, uh, though it's worth a read, it's very old. But the newer papers are, uh, there are a lot of newer papers. But these are some of the names that I mentioned. Mm, okay, there was one question that I have been asking, uh, that I have been wanting to ask since some time. Um, it is, when you're an investor, there are a lot of external factors also that affect. and at a time like say during recession or you know some time where your external factors overwhelmingly take toll on the price or your investments and you know um, they are in jeopardy then what exactly do you do under such circumstances okay so i believe that brings us to the end of the webinar and thank you everyone for attending thank you